what, what's everybody's favorite type of food? Just one person, raise your hand. What's your favorite type of food? Burrito. Burrito? Mine's soul food. And Adrian Miller is going to talk to us right now about what soul food is and what it's becoming in the future. Thank you. So good evening, I'm Adrian Miller, and I'm the author of a book called Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time. Now, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, which immediately loses me street cred on the subject of soul food, right? <laughs> like, what do you know? Well, this is how I win people back. I tell them, first of all, I, um, my mother's from the South, she's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my dad is from Helena, Arkansas. So I grew up eating these foods. The most the strongest expression of it was on the holidays, because we would Thanksgiving we would have the turkey with soul food sides, and then on New Year's Day we would have a traditional New Year's plate, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to share with you the future of soul food as I see it. In order to research my book, what I did is I went around the country and I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities, 15 states. If you were my Facebook friend, I brought you along for the ride because I would take a picture of the place, I was about to eat, I would take a picture of the food, and I would describe what I was going to eat. I got so many notes of concern that year, I called it my year of living dangerously. <laughs> Which gets to really the future of soul food, because one of the main critiques of soul food is that it needs a warning label, right? That if you eat these foods, you're going to die. And so I wanted, in my book, I really wanted to address that. So we're first going to talk about soul food in the present tense, and then I'll talk about uh, the future of soul food and give you some highlights of my national eating tour. First question though, what is soul food? Soul food is the, one of the traditional foods of African Americans, there are several, and it's really the food of the millions of people that left the South after emancipation, millions of African Americans, who left the South after emancipation and settled in other parts of the country. And when they settled in other parts of the country, they did what any other migrant group does. They get to the new place and they try to recreate home. And often they do this through food. And if they couldn't get the same foods they had in the South, they substituted others and then borrowed from the new people, their new neighbors in the other cities. Two, this term soul food, where does it come from? Well, the conventional wisdom is that it comes in the 1960s because we have the black power movement, strong cultural expressions like black is beautiful. But actually soul food as a term goes back in the English language back to Shakespeare. We just celebrated his 450th birthday yesterday. And a lot of coined phrases come from Shakespeare. But in Shakespeare's first play, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, we have two characters, Julia and Lucetta, talking about this hunky guy named Proteus. And Julia says to Lucetta, Oh, knowest thou not that his looks are my soul's food? Pity the dirt that I have pinted in by longing for that food so long a time. So we learned a couple of things. One, even in the late 1500s, it wasn't unusual for two girlfriends to describe a guy as dummy. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is that Shakespeare is this master of wordplay, playing off the tangible and the intangible. And that's getting to the heart of soul food. It's the idea that African Americans, because of centuries of oppression, Anything that we're going to do is going to be the most soulful expression of humanity, right? So let's go through a, a, a typical meal. And if you're from the South or if you're used to Southern foods, a lot of this is going to look familiar. All right. So we, uh, one of the entrees could be fried chicken or smothered chicken. Um, this, that's a plate from a place called Deborah's Kitchen in Philadelphia. Uh, also in fried fish. Now catfish is probably the most popular soul food fish, but the catfish prices are rising, so you're seeing a lot of people at their homes and in restaurants substituting tilapia, but perch, whiting, all, any kind of cheap fish is typical with soul food. Also variety meats. So variety meats are the funky parts of the animal, things like pig's feet, oxtails, pig ears. These are smoked neck bones from a place in, called uh, Bully Soul Food in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and then also chitlins. Now for the uninitiated, chitlins are pig intestines that are either stewed or fried. It's not for everyone. A lot of people don't like chitlins because of what they are, or also because of the smell. I think of it as a perfume, but for other people, it's incredible fun. <laughs> so they just can't feel it. But that's the chitlin pot from my um, Thanksgiving home. So at Thanksgiving in my family, we have chitlins on Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. So that's actually the chitlin pot from my parents' house. All right, next is greens. So this is again from Jackson, Mississippi. Now, I love this shop because this picture was taken right off the main dining room. In soul, food, uh, in soul food culture, the greens we eat are mustard, turnip, kale, collard, and cabbage. For all of you who are eating kale now, we say in soul food circles, welcome to the party, because we've been eating it for 300 years. 
And then also black eyed peas, which is really a bean, but black eyed peas are very common uh, in the South as well. Black eyed peas are indigenous to West Africa, and they come across the Atlantic during the slave trade. For those of you who are familiar with Southern culture, the reason why it pairs greens and black eyed peas on the same slide is because on New Year's Day, you're supposed to eat both of these things for good luck. So black eyed peas are for good luck or coins, and greens will bring you money, holding money in the New Year. Uh, also candy jams, and candy jams are really sweet potatoes, so what we call yams in this country are not true tropical uh, yams. They're actually a dark flesh sweet potato, but that's common in soul food. And also macaroni and cheese. Now I did not think macaroni and cheese was really a strong thing in soul food culture. I thought it was just a unan uh, you know, an ubiquitous, universal comfort food. But so many of my African American friends threatened to slap me inside my head if I didn't include it in my book, I ended up doing it. And there is actually a strong soul food angle because macaroni and cheese was actually very popular in the South, especially in the big houses where you had enslaved African Americans doing the cooking well before Italian immigrants arrived in this country in large numbers. There's also soul food cornbread. These are a couple of soul food uh, cornbread muffins from a place called the Hard Knocks Cafe in San Francisco. Interesting thing about this place is that it's a soul food joint run by Asians. And I thought it was really good stuff. Uh, in soul food culture, we also put hot sauce on everything. Louisiana style hot sauces are the most popular. Um, but there's also things like uh, uh, pepper vinegar, where essentially you get the chili peppers you want, you put them in a bottle or whatever, pour vinegar over it, and then cork the bottle and leave it there as long as you want to get the spice level uh, that you desire. And then also Tabasco is one of the Louisiana style hot sauces, and it's the most popular hot sauce in the world. Personally, I like others like Frank, the Louisiana style. Um, a Louisiana brand uh, hot sauce, but Tabasco is very popular. Okay, uh, Kool-Aid. I think that red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. Now you have to understand that in soul food circles, red is a flavor. We don't get caught up in calling something strawberry or cherry or saying it has hints of cranberry. It's just red. Right? <laughs> now the disturbing thing is that a lot of youngins seem to like purple drinks more than red drinks, and I'm not sure what that's about. And I write in my book, I do believe the children are our future, that we should teach them well and let them lead the way, but they're messing it up on Kool-Aid. <laughs> Another drink that I'm trying to um, get made more popular is something called hibiscus aid. And hibiscus is a flower that's native to West Africa, comes across the Atlantic during the slave trade, takes root in Jamaica, and then starts spreading itself around Central America and Latin America and um, South America. And actually, if you've been to a taqueria and you've had agua de Jamaica, Jamaica water, you're drinking a West African drink. And it has the same formula as Kool-Aid. You get some water, color it red, because you use the flower petals to color it red, sweeten it to taste. And in a lot of African American restaurants and in social situations, you will often see a red drink. Uh, soul food desserts. I couldn't settle on one dessert in my book, so I decided to write about four. So one is sweet potato pie, another one is peach cobbler, and these are actually riffs of old British desserts. So you see a, a, a lot of influence of higher end English cooking in soul food. Uh, banana pudding, that's a banana pudding that I made myself uh, with a homemade custard and meringue and using vanilla wafers. And then you caught me in a greedy moment. So I talked about pound cake, but I was at an all you can eat place in rural Mississippi and the, the, uh, the buffet line was getting ready to close. So I just grabbed a bunch of desserts. So that's why you see peach cobbler and banana pudding on there. But uh, uh, pound cake is a very uh, traditional soul food dessert. Okay, so the future of soul food. Uh, this is a picture of a smothered turkey chop in Deborah's uh, kitchen in Philadelphia. And I show you this because one future for soul food is fusing it with other cultures and their ideas. And so uh, the turkey chop is an Amish cut of meat that gets uh, basically given a soul food treatment. So you take this Amish cut of meat, you do it like you would do a pork chop. So you flour it, fry it lightly, and then you braise it in gravy for a while until it is delicious. Now the reason why they do these things in Philadelphia is that the black Muslim population is so strong that if you're a restaurant, you're just not going to have a lot of pork items on your menu. Next, chicken and waffles. If, have you been to Cora Bay's here in Denver? It's on 29th and Colorado Boulevard. So uh, chicken and waffles is a very popular com combination in soul food circles. Um, and it has a long history. The common story you hear is that it started in jazz era Harlem in the 1920s because people were coming out of the jazz clubs too late to eat dinner, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning and too early to eat breakfast. And so this entrepreneur created this hybrid dish. But actually, chicken and waffles goes back to old Europe. The Pennsylvania Deutsch, what we call them Pennsylvania Dutch, 
who land in the rural countryside uh, in Pennsylvania, they actually brought a cream waffle, a uh, cream chicken, excuse me, and waffle tradition here to the United States. And so fried chicken is just a rip off that. Now that is a cinnamon waffle, as Cora Face calls it, but we know that that's not a color that exists in nature, so some other stuff was added to that waffle. All right, now I want you to gird yourself because I'm going to show you something really shocking. You may want to cover the kids' eyes for this. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Kool-Aid pickle. The Kool-Aid pickle. Has anybody here had a Kool-Aid pickle? All right, this is how you make a Kool-Aid pickle. You take an already made dill pickle, you prick holes in it, you get the pickle brine and make Kool-Aid out of the pickle brine. Then you drop the pickle into the pickle brine, leave it there for three days to two weeks, depending on your taste. And then it gets this color, and then you take it out and eat it. If you like the taste of Kool-Aid and pickles, it's just a sweet and sour. If you don't like either one of those things, this is one of the nastiest things you'll put in your mouth. It's very popular in rural Mississippi. Uh, then, uh, the prize for the weirdest soul food in my journey around the country goes to Los Angeles. So I went to a place called Tony Soul, soul Burger, and I had a Thanksgiving burger. And here's a soul food Thanksgiving burger. Bun, turkey patty, because all the patties that she uses in her place are turkey. Turkey patty, a layer of collard greens, a layer of cornbread dressing, a layer of cranberries, and then a layer of sweet potato puree. Bun, take a bite, it tastes like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Next is a soul food hot dog in North Hollywood. Here's a soul food hot dog. Bun, wiener, collard green and cucumber relish, sweet potato drizzle, crumbled bacon bits. Not bad. I like this place, uh, Otis Soul Dog in North uh, Hollywood, because they also had a mural. If you're a fan of the show Good Times, remember when the credits are rolling and everybody has that mural of everybody in a pool hall? They had an exact replica of that mural, except everyone has a hot dog. <laughs> uh, another trend is kind of down-home healthy. And this idea is taking traditional soul food and maybe taking out the pork or the fatty ingredients and treating it another way. So this is a recipe for my book. This is something called Creole Broiled Catfish. So it's just taking catfish, rubbing it in olive oil, sprinkling on some Creole seasoning, whatever your favorite type is. I like Black River. Creole seasoning from Savory Spice Shop, a local spice shop, and then broiling it for about eight minutes and eating it. And people go crazy for this, and this is one of the most simple recipes I have in my book. Okay, and then there's also a trend for upscale soul food. In fact, it's so upscale, they don't even put the word soul food a lot of times when they're describing it. They'll call it uh, southern cooking or down-home cooking or other things. But the idea is just to take something that's a soul food ingredient and give it finer ingredients or a finer treatment present it in front of you and charge you a lot of money and you'll go ahead and pay that. Um, the interesting thing about this kind of movement towards upscale soul food is that if you think about these foods in the soul food context, people say, oh, that's the most disgusting thing. How can you eat that? Um, like pig's feet, for example. Soul food in restaurants, pig's feet. But then you move to a white tablecloth fancy restaurant, pig's feet becomes trotters. And then people have a different mindset. They're like, oh, this food is so amazing. The chef is so daring. They're taking us to places we've never been with food. It's just all because of the difference in context. All right, and I'll end here by talking about vegan and vegetarian soul food. Sounds like an oxymoron, but this is where most of the creative energy is in soul food right now. This is from a place called Solely Vegan in Oakland, California. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Southern Fried Tofu. In the middle is vegan mac and cheese. And on the far side is vegan collard greens, and that's a cayenne pepper um, lemonade. If you close your eyes and bite into that southern fried tofu, which is shaped to look like fried chicken, it actually has the texture and taste of catfish. Not that bad. And the interesting thing about vegan and vegetarian soul food is that if you actually take a deeper look at enslaved food ways and what the enslaved were eating during slavery, it's closer to what we call vegan, because they were eating vegetables and season, season there was not a lot of processed ingredients, not a lot of meat. They pretty much just had water to drink. And so as much as ve a vegan and vegetarian soul food is cast as a departure from traditional soul food, it's really a homecoming. Because that's really what people were used to in the rural South. And the interesting thing is, if you look now at what dietitians are telling us to eat, dark leafy greens, legumes, fish, sweet potatoes, these are all the building blocks of soul food. And so it's a matter of just rethinking these foods, 
and taking the glorious stuff like fried chicken. I mean, does anybody really believe we should have fried chicken every day? Usually it's, <laughs> usually it's somebody in the audience. Uh, you know, those were special occasion foods in the South. And a lot of the foods that we think about for immigrant cuisines were special occasion foods. So I'm just uh, asking folks to rethink soul food. And ultimately, I say soul food doesn't need a warning label. It just needs more love. Thank you.